huddled down in the Allegheny Mountain Range of West Virginia. This is the Robert C. Byrd Green Bank Telescope. The world's largest fully steerable radio telescope can observe the cosmos in stunning detail. This piece of modern technology opens the door to finding the answers to some of humankind's most extraordinary questions and gives astronomers a vantage point into seeing the unseen. The history of studying radio waves began in the 19th century when James Clerk Maxwell developed his theory of electromagnetic waves. Then, in the early 20th century, scientists like Hertz and Marconi successfully demonstrated the transmission and reception of radio waves. In 1932, Carl Jansky, an American physicist, detected radio waves coming from beyond the Earth's atmosphere. Jansky's work laid the foundation for radio astronomy, with other scientists gravitating to the field amid other discoveries of cosmic radio waves. Five years later, radio amateur Groot Reber built the first radio telescope in his backyard in Wheaton, Illinois. In 1957, the Reber Radio Telescope was acquired by the newly founded National Radio Astronomy Observatory and moved to Green Bank, West Virginia, where it stands today next to a replica of Jansky's antenna. Through the years, more antennas and telescope arrays were built at the observatory and opened the door to a new era of astronomical discoveries and radically altered how we viewed the night sky. In the summer of 1962, the crown jewel at the observatory was the new 300-foot Green Bank Telescope. At the time, it was the world's largest radio telescope. But it was that size and compounding weight of winter snow that required major upgrades less than a decade later. The massive dish had warped, and so a new higher-grade aluminum mesh was installed. With its upgrades complete, the Green Bank Telescope continued as an invaluable asset to the scientific community, all the way until 1988. Just before 10 p.m., on a cold November's night, the telescope operator at the time reported hearing a crack and, quote, a low rumble, like an overhead jet aircraft, end quote. Moments later, a large piece of steel tore through the ceiling. In a heartbreaking instant, the delicate scientific tool was reduced to a twisted heap of metal and electronics. The data showed the dish had been ripping open slowly for a few days before a component for the structural integrity came loose, sending one of radio astronomy's greatest telescopes off to the scrapyards. The collapse of the Green Bank Telescope was a significant blow to the astronomy community. After a decade of construction, the improved telescope went online in 2000. It earned its new name from one of the longest serving senators in U.S. history, Robert Carlisle Byrd, representing West Virginia. The Senate Majority Leader at the time, Byrd led the push to secure funding for the telescope's construction. The story of astronomy is the story of mankind, it's our origins, it's how we came to be, how planet Earth came to be, how the sun came to be. And that's an important story. I think it's important for us to understand where we came from and where we're going. The first time I saw the GBT, it was a breathtaking moment. If you've ever driven to Green Bank, and as you're going towards the observatory, it's like seeing a dinosaur in Jurassic Park. You're driving in, in your Jeep, and it is breathtaking, the scale of that telescope, and you just feel like you're in the presence of this engineering marvel which is collecting really, really, really faint radiation from space. But just being there at the GBT is an experience. It's not just the first time you see it, it's every time you see it. The GBT, as it's known, stands over 485 feet tall. That's taller than both the Statue of Liberty and the Great Pyramid in Egypt. The 100-meter dish provides a collecting area of over two acres, and its unblocked aperture opens up 85% of Earth's celestial sphere to observation. And while Big is known for being better, the GBT tips the scales at nearly 17 million pounds. It's the agility of its fully steerable base that means it can be pointed in any direction to observe objects in the sky. This was 
an exquisite design for a telescope. There's a considerable engineering that goes into having an instrument like that. It was needed because large single dishes are both sensitive and they are great instruments for covering large portions of the sky and detecting very faint radio waves. There was a need to have such a telescope in the US. It was essential for many areas of astronomy. The large single dish can give you the context for how that solar system is forming. You know, what is the extent of the molecular cloud in which these young stars and planets are forming? And which is why it was important to have a premier single dish telescope to fill the gap that was left by the 300 foot, but also to really advance new discoveries. So it's the largest fully steerable radio telescope in the world, largest fully steerable telescope in the world. We can steer it everywhere. So the, that size translates to collecting area. We can collect very faint signals, a lot of them. And so we are very sensitive. We can see very faint things with this telescope. More than just a looking glass to the stars, it's what the GBT and other telescopes represent. Mankind's continued exploration in the quest for understanding, whether it's been our migration across the continents or enduring grueling conditions to reach the poles, we continually look towards the next frontier. When we think about astronomy, we've got to think about the fact that when you're looking at something that's very distant, you're actually looking into the past. And so astronomers can peer all the way to the cosmic horizon when the universe was just really forming into what we see it today. And there's how many of them are out there? Well, there's just as many as you can count. The universe is filled with galaxies. It's part of what's so fun about all this. And so sometimes you can be observing along and discover new galaxies. That just happened the other day. We're in the discovery business. I think it's important for us to understand where we come from. We are intimately connected with astronomy. So the carbon atoms in your body, the nitrogen atoms in your body, the oxygen atoms in your body were made inside of stars. So you are literally made out of star stuff. So this stuff that we study is not something else out there. We are intimately part of that So We are made of that stuff. So the stuff that we study is the stuff in us. Back in the early 20th century, scientists first discovered that the universe is filled with radio waves. These waves, which are a type of electromagnetic radiation, can be detected and studied using specialized equipment like the Green Bank Telescope. So what can we learn from studying radio waves? A lot, actually. Radio waves can tell us about the temperature, composition, and motion of objects in space. Radio waves can also reveal the presence of certain types of gases and other materials, which can help us understand the processes that take place within stars and galaxies. The telescope was designed to observe radio waves from distant objects in the universe, such as pulsars, quasars, and galaxies. We're searching for gravity waves. And the way we do that is we look at these uh, rotating stars called pulsars, which are in themselves pretty amazing. They're about the size of a city, uh, but they contain the mass of a star, and it's whirling about the speed of a blender. So as this thing rotates around, they have this pulse of radio emission like a lighthouse, and every time it swings around, you see a pulse, just like you would see the light from a lighthouse beacon. Other things we look for are how stars form. So we look at the gas in space between the stars, the interstellar medium. I study uh, what are called low surface brightness galaxies. The reason the GBT is the most amazing telescope in the world for this kind of research is that these galaxies tend to have a lot of gas in them. So because they're so diffuse, so spread out, they haven't been able to efficiently form stars. And we try to understand how these gas clouds condense, fragment, and then collapse under their own weight to form stars. So we look at chemistry in space. Now you think that chemistry is just, you know, test tubes and beakers and everything's liquid and you pour things together. But you can have chemistry in these gas clouds as molecules collide. But the telescope's capabilities don't stop there. It is also used for other types of research, including the study of Earth's atmosphere and weather, and the search for extraterrestrial life. We are also looking for techno signatures. So most people think what we do is look for little green men, and we kind of do that. 
partly. We look at about 20% of our time. Radio waves would be a really cheap way to communicate. We communicate by radio waves. It doesn't take a lot of power, and they would stand out if you're broadcasting. If you want to get the attention of another civilization, you send a radio signal, it would stand out against the background. It wouldn't cost you much. It goes at the speed of light, so it would be a very fast and efficient and cheap way to communicate. And so we're looking. We think that they may be doing this. I uh, haven't seen anything yet, but we haven't looked very far yet. We've only begun to look, and we've only covered a small fraction of all the stars in the Milky Way. So they may be out there, and if we discover that, that would be the coolest discovery ever. Probably the most momentous discovery ever made. It is equipped with a number of advanced instruments and technology such as a sensitive receiver that can detect radio waves at a wide range of frequencies, and a powerful computer system that can analyze and process the data from the telescope. The instrumentation is so sensitive, it can detect an energy level that's equivalent to the energy produced when a snowflake hits the ground. So the NSF provides the bulk of our funding. So just as an example, we've, the telescope is showing some signs of age, right? As we all do. It's 20 years old, if you had a 20-year-old car, you would probably notice some components are wearing out. The NSF is supporting us in refurbishing the telescope so that we can make it last for another 20 years. But we're really excited about our future capabilities. The world's premier single-dish telescope is the 100-meter Green Bank Telescope. It has a highly complementary role to things like ALMA or the Very Large Array and the observatories we support are at the forefront of astronomical discoveries. Thousands of scientists across the U.S. and in, indeed the world use our observatories for their science and they make fundamental discoveries. The GBT is a true heavyweight amongst telescopes, making groundbreaking discoveries like the detection of the first pulsar and studying the atmospheres of planets outside our solar system. Its contributions to the field of astronomy have been immense, helping to shed light on the fundamental laws of physics that govern the universe. It has had a, a tremendous impact on astronomy and radio astronomy in particular. You may have heard about the recent discovery of low frequency gravitational waves. The GBT was instrumental in that discovery. These gravitational waves were discovered by monitoring pulsars over a long period of time. And the GBT provided half of the sensitivity for the detection and monitoring of these pulsars. These discoveries would not have been possible without the GBT. Part of what makes the telescope so effective is where it sits. Inside the National Radio Quiet Zone, radio transmissions are restricted by law to minimize harmful interference of the scientific research, restricting use of modern day devices. The FCC created the Quiet Zone in 1958 and comprises an area of approximately 13,000 square miles. About half of the zone is in the Blue Ridge Mountains, while the majority of the rest is in the Allegheny Mountains with a small portion in the Maryland Panhandle. It is a beautiful place and this juxtaposition of the super high tech and the wilderness is just amazing, unique and special. And it really is a big attraction for coming here and working here. We're blessed. The telescope is here for a reason. And the reason is, is because this is one of the most radio quiet places on Earth. And was so the most radio quiet uh, environment. And we have preserved that to some extent. So there is a law called the National Radio Quiet Zone that prevents transmitters from drowning us out. We're listening for things from space. But the remoteness of the place is really part of the tool. We want it to be radio quiet so that our signals are not drowned out by transmitters and you know, the noise that we have. It does cause some issues. We don't have Wi-Fi, for instance, but we do have internet. We don't have radio transmitters or television transmitters. We don't have microwaves, but we're still a very modern and cutting edge thing. Through our search into the universe, we have traced back to its origins and the birth of stars and galaxies. It is through instruments like the Green Bank Telescope that we can see beyond what our eyes can perceive, peering into the distant past to see the origins of our universe and how it evolved over time. Without NSF support helping to provide those facilities, those observatories, I think you wouldn't see the same pace of discoveries 
as you do, but this is particularly true in the case of our radio observatories. They are the instruments that enable astronomers to make fundamental discoveries. And those discoveries then go on to spur even more interesting questions and, and lines of inquiry. That's how science works. It's not a static instrument. There's new developments. We're constantly improving the instruments that are on the GBT. Some of those discoveries may be some things we haven't thought about. Cosmic time scales are very large compared to what we experience in our lifetime. So we can't see things happening in real time when we're looking at these distant objects. So yes, we're necessarily looking back in time. The photons that have come to us are many millions of years old. In a very real way, the GBT allows us to see the unseen. Because light has a finite speed, we're not seeing things instantly as they happen. So the further out you look, the further back in time you look. But as you look out into space, if something is a light year away, you see it as the light left there a year ago, and you see it as it was a year ago. And if you look at something 10,000 light years away, you're looking 10,000 years back into time. So the light that's arriving now took a long time to get to us. Now you can actually look further and further back in time all the way to the Big Bang, which was about 14 billion years ago. And that's as far as you can see, because there wasn't anything before then. We can detect the glow from the Big Bangs, the microwave background, and we can see that with the Green Bank Telescope. And what we're looking for is, in astronomy these days, is, okay, what happened after the Big Bang and how did the universe assemble itself into galaxies? I certainly love using the telescope for my own science. It's a lot of fun. I love taking data and, and seeing the new discoveries. A lot of times when you're doing science, you're going out and you're looking for the thing you kind of expect. You know, I'm gonna go look at this object and I'm gonna see some gas. I'll measure the gas, it should look like this. That's typically science. But every once in a while you get to just get this neat discovery where you go, hey, I detected something, but it's not quite what I thought it was gonna be. And that's where absolutely the most fun science comes in. As an important hub for scientific research and study, the GBT is the perfect platform to inspire the next generation of scientists, engineers, and innovators. The Green Bank Science Center hosts 40,000 visitors per year, offering tours, educational day and overnight trips, workshops and programs to give students and teachers the experience of doing real astronomical research. I've always been passionate about astronomy ever since I was a kid, and I'm, I'm lucky to have this job. It, if I weren't paid to do it, I would do it anyway. It is astonishing that I get paid to think about things out in space, that I get to witness things. It's a, I get to discover things. I get to see things that no one's ever seen before. It's also important to make sure that the the field itself continues and that we enable more discoveries. And I'm, I'm eager to see what discoveries other people will make now and I'll be proud to be part of that to make that happen. As the sun rises, draping over the enormous dish that has been at the forefront of scientific discovery, the engineers and scientists at Green Bank will soon begin their day. They will continue looking beyond our galaxy, into the universe's past, helping us to understand in ways that were previously unimaginable, helping us to see the unseen. <laughs>